Welcome to worship at St. John's United Methodist Church. So glad that you have allowed us into your home and that we can worship together today. There is quite a bit going on at St. John's. We've kicked off some new things. Last Thursday, we had our first Fusion Bible study through Zoom. If you did not have an opportunity to join us for that, there's still um, room for you to come in. You didn't miss very much. So that will be on Thursdays, and the instructions for the Zoom meeting will be given through email. Also, today, if you're an early bird and you are watching this early, I wanted to let you know that the sanctuary will be open at 10 o'clock today so that we can gather together, hear some scripture that is different than what you will hear um, today in worship, but also have a time of prayer and community and also share what's going on in our own lives, um, our own hearts, and be able to respond in prayer through that. So you're invited to come at 10, wear your mask, and of course, we'll be ready to be socially distanced, and we'll have hand sanitizer ready to go. Um, so as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship, let's take a moment to um, focus on all that God is doing in our own personal life.
if you walked out of the grave, who are you talking to? If you walked out of the grave, who are you walking to? And now we come to a time of offering and prayer. Um, we've just come through a whole sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit, uh, one of which is uh, the fruit of generosity. Uh, and we just want to make mention of the fact that it's clear to us that, that you reflect God's generous spirit all the time. Um, generous with your time, generous with your love, generous with sending cards and making phone calls and contributing to whatever collecting we're doing here for people in need. And also, of course, generous with your financial gifts. So we want to say thank you um, to say that God's generous spirit flows right through you. It's very clear. So thank you for whatever way you contribute to uh, financially to the church, whether you do that by mail or you do that through the bank or uh, by, through the app or online. Thank you very much for the ways that you are supporting the ministries of St. John's. And now, please join me in a time of prayer. Gracious and holy God, as we worship this day, settle our hearts and calm our spirits. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Be present with us as we gather in twos or threes or even by ourselves to worship and to praise your name. Open our hearts and our minds to your presence and help us to rejoice and give thanks for this moment, for these few moments in time that we get to spend with you. Merciful God, we are still reeling from the events in our own lives and the events that we see in the world. We hardly know how to respond. So help us take our cues from you. We ask that you guide and direct our steps, our actions, our speech, and our thoughts. Remind us, O oh God, of who you are. Remind us, O oh God, of who you have called us to be. Remind us, O oh God, of how very much you love us. Remind us, God, of your character, of grace and mercy and faithfulness and strength. Help us to see ourselves as beloved children of God. And then open our eyes to see the people around us, as your beloved children as well. Open our ears to really listen to the voices of the unheard. Grow us up, Lord. Help us to recognize our blessings, the good things that come from your hand. Gracious God, you have abundantly blessed us with so much. Our gratitude lists are testaments to your generosity and love. Speak to us firmly when we desire more than what is enough. 
for us. Keep us from being greedy, God. Instead, open our hands and our hearts to share what has been given so generously to us. Give us courage to trust that as we are generous with our resources of time and love and service and gifts and mercy and forgiveness, that we will not be depleted. Instead, show us that your abundant gifts and graces will just continue to flow through us so that we might share with the people around us. God of hope and healing, we pray for those who need your comfort, your peace, your forgiveness, your guidance, and your love. Lord, we know that there is much suffering in this world. And we ask for you to be a powerful presence in the midst of that suffering. We pray for all of those who mourn their losses today. We pray for healing for the sick. We pray for discernment in the, for those in leadership. We pray for ways that we might act as your ambassadors of love. And we are counting on your spirit to guide and direct us. For we place all our trust and confidence in you, loving God, as we pray this prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today we're starting a new series on bedtime stories and lifetime virtues. Growing up, I was very blessed to... Uh, be in a household full of readers. And so I got read to a lot. I got told stories a lot. So my mom, she shared lots of Bible stories with me growing up. My dad preferred fables like Billy Goat's Gruff and The Selfish Giant. My grandmother on my dad's side would begin... Um, telling me poems that she learned and memorized as a child. And she'd always just have this great smile of delight when she'd recite them. And then my mom's mom would just make up stories. She had the most spectacular imagination. Narrative, the giving and receiving of narrative has always been a part of my life. And the thing about narrative is we learn through narrative. You think about it, Jesus says, come to me as a little child. Little children love narrative, and we pass down our values, our virtues, on how to live right through narrative. Jesus taught in story form, and we call them parables. So as we go through this series that will take us through almost all of the summer, we will be looking at Bible narrative, those stories that we grow up learning from small children, and, but also looking at fables and fairy tales to see what we have forgotten maybe, but also to stir up our own imaginations and our own nostalgia and maybe even some of our own memories of our childhood. But it also might remind us to tell our own stories what are those stories that we would like to share, that we would like to pass down from one generation to the next? And it, all, it also might remind us to listen. So, so may the word of God fall afresh on your ears as we look at the story from 2 Samuel, starting with verse 1. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle... David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon 
when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house, that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I'm pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out to, of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, you have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark in Israel and Judah remain in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. As Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant warriors. The men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite was killed as well. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we look at this story and we think about what we learn from it, every time a story is told, it's told with intention. There's things that the writer wants the hearers to know. And as the story unfolds, we find out that David is not where he's supposed to be. It's at a time when the kings are off to war, and David's troops are even off to war. But David is not with them. David is safe and sound and secure in his palace. And not only is he at home, but we find out at the opening of the story that he had just arisen off his couch, or he had just gotten out of bed. And he goes out on his terrace when his people are off to war, and he looks out upon his peaceful countryside, and he sees a woman. When we talk about self-discipline, we talk about what it means to be content, to be aware of the temptations around us, to know what we already have and to be grateful. David already has more than one wife. David has more than two wives. David has several wives. But when he looks down and he sees a woman that he does not know, and she's very beautiful, his temptation is too great. 
And he asks the people around him, who is that woman? Bring her to me. And David has the intention of making Bathsheba his own. David's self-discipline is out of control. Last week we talked about self-control being a part of the fruit of the Spirit. Part of what God works within us bringing about self-control, but the understanding that we also partner with God and practicing our disciplines. Practicing doing the right thing, practicing not doing the wrong thing. David lost all control. In fact, this becomes a complete train wreck for him. And as he goes through every step of it, he's not even self-aware enough to be able to stop it. And even after Uriah's death, David doesn't want to lay claim to what's happened. It isn't until the prophet Nathan comes and tells David a story. The prophet Nathan shows up, and he says, David, I want to tell you about a man in your kingdom. He is so very wealthy. He has so much, and he has sheep, and he has goats galore, so many that he can't count. And he has a neighbor who was poor who has one, one little ewe lamb, and he's been raising this little lamb This lamb eats from his table, drinks from his cup. This lamb lives in his household. The rich man is expecting company, and he needs to be able to provide a meal. And instead of selecting one of his own flock, he goes and he takes this man's one and only lamb. He slays it, he kills it, and prepares it as a meal. David What do you think should happen to this man? And David is absolutely outraged. It isn't until David hears this story that he's able to connect the dots when Nathan says, David, you are that man. You took something that did not belong to you. Earlier this week, you got the opportunity to hear another story. David McKnight told us the story of King Midas and the Golden Touch, a story of another king who was dissatisfied with what he already had, a man who had his own room filled with gold, and he loved to go in that room and count it. He had a daughter who wanted to spend time with him, but he found more pleasure in spending time with his gold. Both of these kings were dissatisfied, and both of these kings had a lesson to learn of what it meant in self-discipline. Discipline takes practice. It takes being grounded in what we have, and being, part of it is being satisfied with what we have. And whenever we are out of control and we cannot control our temptations, it feels like life is spinning out of control. For King David, it was the loss of a man's life, a good man. And not only the loss of a good man, a good soldier, but later on, David experiencing the loss of his firstborn by Bathsheba. For King Midas, it was the loss of his only child when he went to embrace her and she turned to gold. One of the lessons in our own life is to realize that the only person we get to control in this world is ourselves. We make the choices about our virtues, what we value, how we're going to act from day to day. And the only person that can control you is you. No one else. Now, there may be times that you're manipulated. There may be times that you are tricked. But ultimately, on a day-to-day basis, you are the only person that you can control, and the only person that can control you is you. When we ground ourselves with that knowledge, we partner with the idea 
understanding of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Being a disciple takes discipline. When we hear the expectations of who Jesus is calling us to be, to be people of love, to love our God with all that we are, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to love one another, and to even love our enemy. This takes great discipline. And I can't help but think about John Wesley's three simple rules. Do no harm, do all the good you can, and stay in love with God. All of these are extremely important, but the foundational one is to stay in love with God. And what that means, John Wesley's original language, was to, to be aware and to practice all the ordinances of God. To experience God through prayer and scripture. Basically be, practicing being in relationship with God. Spending that time listening to God so that God's spirit can rest in every single one of us who are connecting with God, so that we can do no harm, so that we can do all the good that we can. It is very hard to control ourselves when there isn't a spirit that tempers us. That when God, when we talk about the spiritual fruits and God sharing God's virtues with us, that this tempers who we are. Paul described it as our old nature and our new nature. That our old nature is always rising up, trying to cause a muck, causing us to be out of control. Whereas God's spirit comes and tempers us and calms us and gives us peace so that these virtues can rise up within us. But this takes self-discipline. It takes self awareness. It takes not only knowing who you are, but also knowing your own stories. What has made you who you are? And knowing the stories of God, that ultimately you are God's child. And God is constantly recreating you to be more like Christ, which takes not only the work of God, but also for you to do the work within yourself. God's Holy Spirit is working within each one of us, and God's Holy Spirit is working across our community, our state, our nation, in every aspect of our life. So your homework this week is to share some of your own childhood memories. Those memories of what made you who you are today. Maybe stories of your parents or your grandparents or traditions in your own household or some great memory that formed you in your own life. To tell this story to someone else, to tell your own narrative, but then also to sit back and invite someone to share their narrative with you to ask that question, tell me a story about yourself. Tell me one of your virtues. Why is it important? Tell me something that you value. Tell me what it was like growing up. Tell me what it's like to be you. It is through narrative that we learn about God. We learn about ourselves and we learn about each other. So let's look forward to hearing those stories, telling those stories, and being a part of each other's stories. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
As we close worship today, thank you so much for joining in. I want to thank the musicians that have been sharing music with us every single week. We are so very blessed to continue to be able to worship in this format. I know that each one of you are looking forward to coming back into the sanctuary. Again, you'll have that opportunity on Sundays at 10 a.m. So if you're watching this early, congratulations, you can still come up to the church. Um, and if not, know that next Sunday is also a great opportunity for you to do that. As we close worship, hear this blessing upon you and your household. May the Spirit of God be working within your own soul, rising up within you, bearing the very virtues, the spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit, of our one true God, that we may be a reflection of Jesus Christ and his amazing love always and everywhere. Amen. Whenever you're, are you ready? We're rolling. Oh, we're rolling. Okay, this is not good. <laughs> okay, so can we just cut off that last snippet, or do I have to do all that over again? Can, can we cut off so we're rolling? Okay.